everybody. Hi, my name is Heather Palacios. I'm on staff here at Church by the Glades, and I hope you guys had a good Thanksgiving. Um, if you are visiting from out of town for the holiday, or maybe you're a little more new to Church by the Glades, I wanted to actually introduce you to our pastoral team. We have a, a, a small pastoral team, but they're a powerful pastoral team, and I think they're the best in the world. And I'm not sure if you know who they are. So uh, let's start with some pictures here. Of course, Pastor Dave. David and Lisa, and there's Pastor Roy and Sheila, that's Pastor Nick and Stacy, Pastor Tom and Emily, Pastor Rob and Tamara, who are up at Lake, our Lake Worth location. Yeah, shout out for them. Pastor Lucas and Jessica, Pastor Fred and Melissa, Pastor Joey and Tamara. They're awesome, and there are normal pastors and wives here at Church by the Glades. I saved one of the pastors and his wife. Oh, there we go. All right, so to quote the old Sesame Street song, there's always that one kid doing his own thing. That would be me. And I am married to the nice, kind, normal Raul Palacios. But we are um, we're gonna talk a little bit about these pictures and me. The title of my message is How to Live with Difficult People. I'll be speaking in the third person as I'm the one who has been difficult for 23 years in marriage to Raul. Everybody just do like a, oh, poor Raul, ready? Oh, oh, I know. All right. We'll be in 1 Samuel 25. And what's more important to me for you guys today is that you not remember our situation, your situation but you remember what the Bible has to say about the situation of living with difficult people. Thank God God included that kind of stuff in his Bible because it's the Bible that's the manual for all of our relationships, easy and difficult. And I was really glad to find 1 Samuel 25. So let me get some context to what's happening in 1 Samuel 25. Um, at this time, King Saul is on the throne. David is not yet king. But David is a hero. The people love him. He's killed tens of thousands of enemies. He's slayed a giant named Goliath. But Saul is very jealous of David. And so he's out to get him. So David is always, you know, he's, he's an outlaw at this time. He's on the run from King Saul. And he's got a small army of guys that love him and are loyal to him. And where they are camping out at during this time is next to the property of a really rich man, like Elon Musk rich, like Warren Buffett, Buffet, but whatever that squillionaire's name is. Um, this guy's really loaded. He has lots and lots and lots of, of um, sheep and goats and shepherds and, and herdsmen that are taking care of his property. And that's where David and his guys are. And out of David's just intuitive leadership, him and his men provide protection and security to this rich man's shepherds and flocks um, from burglaries, from predator animals, from raids. They just decided, hey, we're strong, we're armed, we'll look out for this man's property and his animals and his people. And that's where we pick up with who this really rich man is. First Samuel Chapter 25, verse 3 says, This man's name was Nabal, and his wife Abigail was a sensible, beautiful woman. But Nabal, a descendant of Caleb, was crude and mean in all his dealings, i.e. salty. Caleb, he was very salty. And before we get too deep into the text today, I just want to do a quick character study on Nabal and Abigail. Um, if you're old, Consider this the cliff notes. If you're young, consider this the spark notes. But I did all the hard work. I just want you guys to know kind of a little bit about these two people. First, let's start off with their namesakes. Abigail, her namesake is my father rejoices. That's beautiful. So precious. Similarly, my husband, Raul Palacios, his namesake is strong defender palace. That's nice. That's got a little ring to it. Strong defender in a palace. Conversely, 
Nabal means fool. Intellectual, moral, fool. Similarly, my name, which before I got married was Heather Funk, is purple weed dejected mood. So right out of the gate here, we have these two people that drive people crazy really living up to their namesakes. Now let's talk a little bit about Nabal, about his behavior. Nabal was contemptuous, the Bible says, in all of his dealings. And the operative word there is all. That means that Nabal was a difficult person chronically. Not just because the dolphins lost, not just because it's that time of the month, not because he's hangry, not circumstantial, not seasonal. He has a chronic disposition of being a difficult person. And I, I want to really speak to that candidly for a minute, because so do I. In our relationship, in, in our home, I'm the difficult person. And maybe you're the difficult person in your situation or in your home. And from experience, I would say that if we have a chronic disposition of difficulty, it's really cool if we can get some expert advice on it. If you're chronically angry, chronically addicted, chronically depressed, it would help if you go and just talk to somebody, get some insight. Why am I like this? What can I do about it? And I'm reminded of this one time where I was in a church lobby and a, a lady approached me privately and was, long story short, looking for my blessing or my consent because she had learned, she told me, that she was bipolar. And so she would, therefore, was going to be filing for divorce from her marriage. And... I was, I've learned over the years to ask some probing questions. So I asked a couple things and I learned that she diagnosed herself from WebMD and Wikipedia, I guess, uh, as a bipolar. And so she had decided that she needed to leave her marriage. I need to be very careful with self prescription, self diagnosis and self analysis um, that I don't play God or I don't play doctor. I'm the difficult person and, and I think we can make some jeopardizing choices if, if we don't take that difficulty to, to somebody that's an expert in that field and, and learn about it a little bit. Um, all right, Abigail, let's talk about Abigail. Her behavior, um, Abigail, you know, she had been married to this difficult person for a long time and kudos to her, you know, for putting up with his shenanigans. But the Bible, you know, when I was studying about Abigail, you know, she never grew bitter. And I just thought that was just really a fascinating thing to share with you guys, is that years of living with a cantankerous, contemptuous, difficult person hadn't made her bitter. And I would say the same thing about Raul. If you know him or if you know of him, he has not become a bitter person, despite the fact that for 23 years he's had to live with a difficult person. How does that happen? Well, God. I mean, you, we, you and I have a choice with ourselves. We can't change the difficult person, but we can choose how we respond to it. And we can grow bitter or we can grow better. And it's a, it's a choice that, that all of us can make. And I'm, I'm really, it's, it, I'm just very thankful that Raul has not grown, <laughs> really thankful that Raul has not grown better, yay! <laughs> All right, a little more context to the story here. So David and his, and his army are out here protecting the sheeps and the goats and the shepherds. And eventually, you know, they, they need some provision because these, these guys and David, they're on the run, you know, and they don't have the luxury of convenience stores and Uber Eats, which low-key I love. But, the, you know, they got to they got to depend on the generosity of other people to provide them with, with provision. And so David and sends some of his guys to this squillionaire named Nabal, and he's like, hey, you know, the, we're here on behalf of David, and, you know, we're really running low on food and water. We've been out here protecting your sheep and your herdsmen. We've never touched them. We've never harmed them. Could you hook us up with, like, some, some food and water, you know? Um, is that, too, you know, too much to ask? Well, apparently it was. Look at Nabal's response. 
Who is this fellow David? Nabal sneered to the young men. Who does this son of Jesse think he is? There are a lot of punks these days who peace out on their masters. Should I take my bread and my water and my filet mignon that I have slaughtered from my shearers and give it to a band of misfits that come from who knows where? Okay, drama. I mean, it... It really was not that difficult for Nabal to say, sure, we'll, we'll give you guys some food and water. Thanks for protecting all of my property all this time. But that wasn't his response. Why? Because he's a difficult person. As a difficult person to live with, over the years, God's convicted me about something. My messiness does not excuse my meanness. I'm sorry. Let me rewind that because I don't think y'all heard that. My messiness does not excuse my meanness. <laughs> and no, none of the difficult people are clapping right now. <laughs> and it's not just some pithy comment. I take my cues from the Bible. As I've trolled the Bible looking for difficult people, and thank God there's some in here. <laughs> Um, I, I, one in particular is the Apostle Paul. The Bible said that the Apostle Paul had a thorn in his side. And we don't know what that thorn is, but any thorn in any of my side is going to make me moody or irritable or difficult. But when you study the life of Paul, you will see that the thorn in his side was not an excuse to hurt others with it. He learned to live with the thorn, and he did not wield it as a weapon toward other people. Now, if you're a difficult person like I am, that you might be like, yeah, but that's impossible. I am the way I am. No, but you've got Jesus Christ in your heart. You're not the way you are. You're the way Jesus created you. So there is a little wiggle room for change and improvement. And I say that to myself. All right, continuing. Meanwhile, one of uh, Nabal's servants went to his wife, Abigail, and told her, David sent messengers from the wilderness to greet your husband, but he cussed them out. These men have been very good to us. In fact, day and night, they were like a wall of protection, protecting us and our sheep. You need to know this, wifey, and figure out what to do, for there's going to be trouble for our master and all of us. He's so psycho, like nobody can ever talk to him. <laughs> Complete this saying with me. One rotten apple can spoil three people. <laughs> One difficult Heather can spoil the whole Thanksgiving dinner. One difficult Heather can spoil the whole team, the whole staff, the whole party. Over the last 22 years, I've watched 20... Oh, 23 years. You know, last night, my husband, Raul, I didn't tell anybody else this. Don't tell anybody. He, after I spoke, he said, um, I said, do you have any feedback? He's like, yeah, you really screwed up. You said this thing five times and it wasn't true. And I'm like, oh my gosh, something theological? He's like, no, we're married 23 years, not 22. <laughs> Semantics. Anyway, where was I? Rotten apple, that's right, okay. But I've watched Raul um, cohabitate through this quiet truth that my crazy is not Raul's master because Jesus is Raul's savior. Crazy, difficultness, high maintenance, does not sit on the throne in our home. God does. And I respect Raul so much that I might drive him crazy, but in our home, Jesus drives the car. All right, continuing. Abigail wasted no time. When Abigail saw David, she quickly got off of her donkey. <laughs> she could, donkey? I mean, okay. This is where the story breaks down because your girl would not be riding on a donkey. And she bowed low before him. I know Nabal, my husband, is wicked and ill-tempered. Please don't pay any attention to him. He's a 
fool, just as his name suggests. But I never even saw the young men that you sent. And here, here's a ton of food and drink. And so what she has to do is, on behalf of the difficult person who really screwed up the situation here and put the family in jeopardy, is she has to save the day, kind of. You know, she has to come in and clean up the mess, right? And I know a lot of you guys have had to do that for the difficult person in your life. I took from this a couple of things about Abigail's response. Number one is that Abigail was attentive to what is ahead. One thing for difficult people, particularly me, is in a crisis or in a high tense moment, I cannot see further than this. My brain is so on fire that I literally start to think and say, it's over, the world's coming to an end, this is it, my final destination, because all I see is the intense right now. And so I've you know, had to understand that in high anxious, high stress situations, I need to lean into somebody that's a little more sound and calmer. And in my case, that would be my husband, Raul. And, and, and here's the deal. That doesn't make me spineless. That doesn't mean that I am the butter-churning, basket-weaving, pastor-wife of the Southern Baptist Convention. I mean, hardly. It just means I have good self-awareness. I know my weakness. And so when we have high, tense, high, stressful situations, I have learned to lean into God and Raul, and not expect anything uh, the other way around, where we're going to lean on me. The other thing I took from Abigail here is that she doesn't throw her husband under the bus, but she doesn't lie for him either. She's like, oh, no, he's a fool. But she also worked hard to fix what was messed up. And listen, I, I know that that's a hard, tight rope to walk with that difficult person. How much do I say? How much don't I say? How much of the mess do I clean up? And how much do I leave so that they can learn from it? Look, I, I understand that from living with Raul, having to do this with me. And I will say that over the last 23 years, how has Raul been able to know where that line is? is by walking very, very closely on a daily, regular basis with the one who created me. If you are in the Bible, if you are in church, if you are listening to good podcasts, if you are getting wisely, wise counsel, God wants you to make it with that difficult person. He doesn't want you to go crazy yourself or burn out or be overwhelmed. He's for you. But for you to hear from him on how to handle her, how to handle him, you gotta, you got to be in a relationship with him daily, seeking his voice on what to do. He will make himself known to you. I've seen this in, in, in Raul's life. I mean, do you think there's like some, some book, How to Handle Heather Michelle Funk Palacios, like that he bought on Amazon.com? He's just had to walk closely with God who created this and ask God, help me. All right, um, continuing. When Abigail arrived home, she found that Nabal was, what, throwing a big party, okay? See, him and I have so much in common. I love parties. <gasps> love parties. And he was celebrating like a king. I, was, I mean, duh, I would love to celebrate like a queen every day. I love New Year's Eve. Raul hates New Year's Eve. I love it. If any of y'all are going out on New Year's Eve, come save me. I'll, I'll go out with you, okay? Because otherwise I'll be home. Okay, he was very drunk. Okay, that's not me. That part of the verse, I'm not, I don't identify that with that. So she didn't tell him anything about her meeting with David until the next day. I think the takeaway from this is awesome and obvious. When living with difficult people, learn when to pick your battles. Learn when to pick your battles. If they're drunk, if they're high, if they're irrational, if they're exploding, pray for the ability 
to wait. You can't, I can't, but God can. God can handle what you can't handle. And God can calm what you can't calm. All right, next. I'm going to land this plane. About 10 days later, the Lord struck him and he, he died. And David sent messengers to Abigail to ask her to become his wife. Mm. Okay, this is kind of where the scripture breaks down for me a little bit. First of all, I would prefer to die of natural causes and not be struck dead by the God. Just saying. Uh, Oh, and secondly, to any of you women who are normal, holy hotties, and you think you're just going to kind of like jump into my spot when I peace out, (laughs) you've been warned. Don't mess with crazy. I'm just kidding. No, I'm not. All right, I always want to wrap this up. I asked Raul, I said, you know, I gave him an exhaustive list, and I said, um, what are the top three things that you would say as advice for living with a difficult person? And I put it in the form of an acronym that spells out GPS, because I thought maybe your difficult person's driving you crazy. Now I'm giving you a GPS. G, godly counsel. If you're living or loving or doing life with a difficult person, you yourself can get godly counsel. And Raul would say for two reasons. First of all, someone to listen to that understands the minds of people like me. You know, go to somebody. If, if, if I was in a car accident and was rendered paralyzed the rest of my life as a quadriplegic, believe you me, Raul would want to sit down with the doctor that would understand, you know, how am I going to do, do life now with her? How can I help her? So Raul has gotten godly counsel for that reason. The other reason Raul would say get godly counsel is he needs somebody to vent to. How's that going to work if he vents to me? Uh, No, but it's not fair that I get to be the difficult person and spout off once in a blue moon, but that he has to be composed and hold it in all the time. No, he needs to be able to vent to someone too. And, uh, And for him to be able to go and talk to a counselor or just a wise godly man in his life has given him that liberty to just be able to vent. And, and, that, and you need to. You need to get that stuff off your chest in a safe place. All right, P is parameters. When you study the Bible, the Bible is chock full of people in leadership that had to have parameters with difficult people. Moses had to do that. Jesus had to do that. Solomon talked about having parameters and boundaries with people in the book of Proverbs. And Raul, I would say, has, I, I, I would say that Raul has had two parameters or boundaries with me that I've identified, and I want to share those with you. The first boundary that Raul has with me is that Raul cannot save me. It is God's job to save me. It is Raul's job to love me. And that's, I really hope that that encourages somebody today that that is constantly feeling the pressure. You You don't have to lay down your life for your difficult person. Jesus already did. You love them and let God save them. The second boundary uh, that Raul has had with me is that Raul does not need to understand me. Do you think anybody wants to be inside of this head? A no. Nobody's inside my mind. Nobody can understand me. And this has been a huge liberty and a huge freedom for Raul and I both. I don't have the expectation, why don't you understand me? I don't, I don't say that. I don't expect that. Because he can't. And Raul doesn't have that expectation and doesn't feel like a failure because he's not understanding me. This has been huge, you guys, huge. We need, to, we need to drop that expectation on both sides of the equation. You know who understands me? God. And that is enough. That is enough. <laughs> Lastly, for GPS, is to stay praying. 
it like grinds on my teeth when I hear people say prayer is the least you can do. <laughs> no, because sometimes prayer is the only thing you can do. And with God, it is plenty. It is never the least we can do. Especially for the difficult person. Sometimes all you can do is pray. You're doing everything you can do. Good for you. Keep praying. Keep praying. So I have um, three little brothers. I'm the big sister. And um, my littlest brother, Chris, has battled severe mental illness and addiction for half of his life. The last 10 years of his life, he lived down here with me, where I wore many hats. I was the bank, I was the grocery store, I was the shelter, I was the counselor, the pastor, the mother, the big sister, the listening ear, the friend, the provider. Um, the last 10 years has taught me a lot about how to love and live a with a difficult person, because I, ha I had that in my little brother. For the last 10 years, though, I took God at his word. In the book of 1 Thessalonians, it says, never stop praying. And I trust God at his word. And so for 10 years, I have never stopped praying for Chris. I prayed when I knew where he was, and I prayed when I knew where he wasn't. I prayed when he was in jail. I prayed when he was in detox. I prayed when he was in the psych ward. I prayed when he was in the hospital from overdosing. I prayed when he was in the hospital from suicide attempts. I prayed when he was in a halfway house. I prayed when he was homeless. I prayed during the day. I prayed during the night. I prayed sometimes in the middle of the night. But I never stopped praying for Chris for the last 10 years. Now last month, um, Chris died in a Publix bathroom. And a skeptic might say, a lot of good your praying did. And I've thought about that and I've wrestled with it. But I would say that the last 10 years, praying did do good. For the last 10 years, I got to see Chris come to church by the glades and we got to baptize him. He invited two halfway houses to church and on one Easter, several of them accepted Christ and got baptized. Church by the, yeah, thank you. Chris even got Church by the Glades to partner with his halfway houses for Feed the City and Serve the City. I think we have a picture here of Feed the City with Chris and then the Serve the City with Chris. And I just want to pause and, and, and just, you know, have a moment with my church family and say thank you for the greatest gifts that you guys bring at Christmas time, for that that sacrifice that you make financially because it goes to great use. It feeds people that are hungry. It serves people that are lonely. So thank you for being a generous church and giving your time and your resources to things like Feed the City and Serve the City. The other thing that I thought about in the last 10 years is in praying for Chris, my faith has grown. There was so many times where I was so helpless, but I wasn't helpless in praying. And when I kept praying, my faith kept growing because prayer is calling down the savior of the world to a situation that you cannot save, but he can. And so pray, never stop praying for your difficult person. Never stop praying for them not the least that you can do it is sometimes the only thing you can do and it can it is the greatest thing that you can do because you're ushering God into their situation so I thought we would close and we would just pray for these difficult people in our lives and it would be an honor to do that with you guys right now if you'd bow your heads with me please God I we just come to you and and I just pray for the people that have a difficult person in their life I pray you would just descend down into their atmosphere, lift them up on a rock higher than themselves, support them, stabilize them, give them an extra dose of grace and mercy, give them double shots of patience. They can't, but you can. 
And Lord, I also pray for the difficult people like me. Lord, we can do a little better. You, we're made in your image. And yes, we're a fallen creation, but we can always do better because with you, nothing is impossible. And I pray we would step into that opportunity today. In your name we pray, amen.